get out. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for some female readers. Good paragraph by Florence Nightingale at some point. Um, a, um, a letter from Luther to his wife. Uh, uh, so it's a male writer, but it's about him. <laughs> so I prefer that. Uh, anybody would like to read that? Uh, another list of Florence Nightingale quotes. <laughs> you you want to trade? Yeah. <laughs> but you're not a woman. <laughs> yeah, Luther, but a woman it has to read it because it's too old. Uh, how old <laughs> this one? You could read this one. It's in Swedish. <laughs> Santa Lucia. Harriet Tubman. Anybody like to read a paragraph from Harriet Tubman? And finally, Katie Luther. <laughs> Harriet Tubman. Got to have a woman who will read Harriet Tubman. You want to fight about it? There's a lady who's going to read Harriet Tubman. Would you like to read a paragraph by when, when the time comes? Oh, thank you. Sonia, um, for the saints, today I'm going to refer to something which some of you may know about, some of you may never have paid attention to, and I'm supposed to use the mic today. So now <laughs> I'm going to refer today to um, pages 15 through 17 at the front of our hymnal, which is called Lesser Festivals and Com Commemorations. Do you know this? Um, section. No one pays much attention to it, but they are the days and the Sundays and the events which we are called upon to remember as Christians, as Lutherans, and uh, they are for each month of the year. And we'll look at that a little bit more closely, but um, I looked at it this morning uh, during a nice pause in the service, not during the sermon, but um, <laughs> during the collection I checked out. Um, this 15 to 17, and it lists the names of all those people um, who are remembered within the Lutheran community. That same list exists in other church bodies also, and it's a lot larger, for example, in the Roman Catholic uh, community. But um, it lists those people that we are called upon to remember for various reasons. So, um, there are other words that we sometimes use, like saints, and um, uh, people who are remembered by the church who are not yet in that full category of sainthood, uh, we commemorate. So um, if we were in the Roman Catholic Church, there's a process via which a person becomes a saint, and I'm rather comfortable with that process because um, I at one time was um, often a part of a community which was pushing to get one of their own um, canonized. So this guy's name was Alois Andritsky, and he was a sorb, as they say in Europe today, but in Texas they say a wind. And those are people of a Slavic background. And the Slavs didn't have many people who were regarded as uh, saints, at least within the Roman Catholic Church, often because many of the Slavic groups are Orthodox. So uh, within the Roman Catholic Communion, uh, the, um, the Wends and the Sorbs had almost nobody. And so they were pushing very hard to get this Alois Andritsky canonized as a saint because there were certain things that saints might be able to do for your village, which is what he came from, a, a village called Radibor. And I had occasion a number of times to worship in that church from which he came. Um, the language is Sorbian. And the, uh, the people there were all hoping that Alois might one day become 
beatified, which has now happened, because he performed one miracle. And then should he perform, or should he have performed, let's put it in the past tense, another miracle, he would be canonized and could be a saint. Uh, as Lutherans, we refer to all kinds of people as saints, and we wonder what does that have to do with uh, the saints we know, like St. John and St. Peter and St. Paul and all those. Um, after the Reformation, we tended to remember those people uh, who were biblical characters or who had been remembered in the church as saints um, with that designation. But following the Reformation, we typically did not uh, add people uh, to that role of sainthood, but we commemorated many, uh, remembering things that they did, uh, faith that they had, service they provided. And I don't really know the exact definition which the commission that works on this business of commemorations uses, but um, it's interesting to me that the list gets longer uh, periodically. More and more women are included uh, because as a society we're moving to be more open. So on a list of perhaps, I never did count the entire list of who's commemorated, but um, there are on the list, I counted them during the offering uh, this morning, uh, 36 uh, somehow, when I counted the other day from that list, I only got 25. Um, but sometimes a Sunday will have three people, Priscilla, Aquila, and somebody else, you know. So there are three people uh, remembered. And so we're going to look at that today because this is Women's History Month. And in Women's History Month, uh, it um, uh, suggests that we might remember the role which women have played in the church. Now, I may have miscaught what uh, Pastor Karen said this morning. I thought she said uh, within the Lutheran church, and that would be incorrect, because many of these people are saints. Um, uh, some are saints, actually, St. Lucy, Santa Lucia, uh, for example. We'll talk about the Swedes in a little bit, um, and how they got on that list. But uh, many of them are commemorated uh, because they had this pattern of, of uh, a, a holy life and a, a service-filled life, caring, lo loving life, uh, and we commemorate them today, but they may not have been Lutheran. They may have been uh, a variety of different um, uh, religious persuasions. So uh, today, we will think of 25, that was my first count, uh, women who are commemorated on this list, but we will choose just six to surprise us. And I'm wondering, as we think about whatever kind of criteria the commission uses to nominate these people for commemoration, and the list is fairly similar, similar in the ELCA and in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. They both have roughly the same women, a couple differences. Uh, but if you think about uh, people in your own life, typically people on the list of commemorationists, no, no, what would the word for that be? Um, people who are commemorated uh, are typically deceased. But as Luther said, we are all saints by baptism, uh, therefore, we could have living saints, and we could re refer to one another as saints if we chose. So, um, given that kind of uh, openness today, uh, let's take a look at these people and ask ourselves who uh, are the saints that we remember and, and why. And maybe think in your own life about people uh, who are worthy of sainthood, or at least people who are worthy of being commemorated because there was something that they did which was loving and caring and serving and faithful and genuine and true and whatever kind of adjectives you might want to come up with. Uh, are there people that you think of that you think she was a neighbor or she was an aunt or she was a teacher, she was my piano teacher, somebody 
that you think is worth remembering by you? Who do you remember? Who do you commemorate in your personal life? Somebody. <coughs> My grandma who held her Bible upside down and read it when she had Alzheimer's. And I was a little boy and her face radiated Christ. <laughs> really. It was just, she was so sanctified. Okay. His grandmother who was Alzheimer's read with her Bible upside down and with a glowing sanctified face. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Anyone else have a memory of somebody you remember, you think about, well, I think your Aunt Millie was a very special person in that regard. Because? Well, she lived to be, what, 102? And uh, she was always somebody that you could admire and look up to. She was always very positive. She was a very spiritual person. She was a person who was interested in other people. Uh, I, it's just, there's just a lot of things that she was wise. Okay. <coughs> and as we commemorate, they don't have to be women just because it's Women's History Month. Uh, yes, um, I don't know her personally, but uh, the person who did the first cataract surgery was a black woman doctor. Huh. Okay. A member of our church, she no longer is living, but Dr. Mary Louise Brown, who um, headed up uh, the, started the nursing program at NSOE, and I was her second in command in doing that, watching her uh, create this program and win the respect of that environment as well as the professionals in the state. And then at the age of 64, went on to become a, a Lutheran ordained pastor. Oh. And um, her church was in West Virginia, and she no longer is with us on this earth, but an extremely inspiring individual. Okay. Who had persistence. When I think of personality attitudes or qualities, I think of persistence is the one of that. Hmm. Yeah, so what else? I had a high school English teacher who I, I still think of the lessons of, of life that she taught. You know, and not just English, but life's lessons, you know. Okay. Anyone else? <coughs> um, in a document called God's Work Our Hands, the ELCA has said this about commemoration. Throughout its history, the church has sought to lift up Christians who have been unique, exemplary people of faith. As a means of recognizing these witnesses, evangelical Lutheran worship, that's our hymnal, includes many commemorations that may be observed in corporate worship as well as in personal devotion. And this is the list of the women from, and I count 25 uh, when I put this together. Today I counted 29, and then I counted again, so it's hard to know exactly, but that's the 2006 ELW. And these are the names of different women, some of which you may recognize, some of which you never heard of, like me, I never heard of some of them, uh, Agnes, because she was a mark here already in the year 304. Lydia, Dorcas, Phoebe, biblical characters who were witnesses. Perpetua, Felicity, martyrs. Uh, Harriet Tubman, we'll talk about her today, along with Sojourner Truth, uh, considered renewers of society. Catherine of Siena, a theologian in April, Mary, uh, May Monica, mother of Augustine. Uh, in Augustine's Confessions, he talks a lot about the influence that his mother had on him, bringing him to faith. Julian of Norwich, um, 
Helena, the mother of Constantine. You may know that Constantine, once he became Christian, sent his mother on trips to Bethlehem and Jerusalem, and she identified, according to the story, places which had taken place in the life of Jesus. Um, Macrina, a theologian, Catherine Winkworth, um, a translator of hymns, many of which we sing, um, Bridget of, uh, of Sweden, uh, Mary and Martha of Bethany. Also, I should say that on that day we commemorate Lazarus, who was in our gospel lesson today. But since we are only dealing with women, women on this list, I didn't put Lazarus on there. Um, August, uh, Claire, uh, and she is the so-called poor Claire, the sister of St. Francis. So interestingly enough, she is listed here uh, as an abbess of uh, San Damiano, but she was the sister of St. Francis. Florence Nightingale, any of you with nursing background certainly know something about her and will read something from her shortly. And Clara Moss, that was a, a woman in the Lutheran Church in America uh, on that same day, she's remembered. Hildegard of Bingen in September, October, Teresa of Avila, November, uh, Elizabeth of Hungary, and December, Lucy, uh, whom the Swedes remember uh, as um, a martyr from the fourth century, but uh, she has a special significance in the Scandinavian countries, especially Sweden, and Catherine von Bora. And from that list, I just grabbed six, uh, my own personal freedom of choice. <laughs> and so we'll look at them. Those other ones that I choose to look at, those other days. I have found it interesting sometimes during the course of the year uh, to be aware of um, who they were on that particular day, what they did, and sometimes there are foods associated with them, sometimes symbols and uh, other kinds of um, visual things that I choose to remember on such days, and we'll talk about that. Let's start with uh, Harriet Tubman. Uh, her real name was Amarinti Ross. And she was born a slave in Maryland, of all places. Uh, when we think of slave states, we may not think of Maryland. Um, she wa Maryland was a slave state, but it did not join the Confederacy. So it did not secede from the Union. Uh, but nevertheless, that's where she comes from, and her first language of all things was Dutch, because as a slave she was uh, enslaved to Dutch masters. Uh, during her lifetime she rescued, many of them were her family members, but 300 slaves, I'm not sure who kept that count, maybe she did, uh, using stations on the Underground Railroad, uh, finding these places where People were willing in the attic or in the basement to secure a slave while everybody was hunting for them and then moving them on to the next station. She was uh, remembered for many things as a scout for the Union Army, activist in women's suffrage, first woman to lead an armed force. She actually led a military group from the North in the Civil War. Uh, she was. Uh, brought up as a Methodist. I'm not sure whether she was actually a member of a congregation, uh, but she was profoundly religious in her remarks. Uh, she died in New York. She had a home, uh, looked like a rather substantial home, uh, and she always said she relied on God to lead. Uh, and we remember her today on the $20 bill. Um, that's a rather new uh, remembrance that we have given to Harriet Tubman. Somebody has her <coughs> a paragraph. Would you read that little paragraph for us that somebody remembers her? <coughs> Harriet Tubman. I want to say a few words about this matter. I am a woman's rights. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. I am followed and reached and touched and chopped and mowed. And can any man do any more well, than that? Well, I have heard much about the sexes being equal. I can carry as much as a man, 
and can eat as much too, if I can get it. I am as strong as any man that is now, and as for intellect, all I can say is, if a woman have a pint and a man a quart, why can't she have her little pint full? You need not be afraid to give up our rights for fear we will take too much, for we can't take more than our pint hold. The poor man seems to be all in confusion and don't know what to do. Why, children, if you have woman's rights, give it to her and you will feel better. You will have your own rights and they won't be as so much trouble. I can't read, but I can hear. I have heard the Bible and have learned that Eve caused man to sin. Well, if woman upset the world, do give her a chance to set it right side up again. The lady has <laughs> spoken about Jesus, how he never spurned women from him, and she was right. When Lazarus died, Mary and Martha came to him with faith and love and besought him to raise their brother. And Jesus wept, and Lazarus came forth. And how came Jesus into the world? Through God who created him and the woman who bore him. Man, where has your part? Where was your part? <laughs> but the women are coming up blessed to be God, blessed be God, and a few of the men are coming up with them. But man is in a tight place. The poor slave is on him. Woman is coming on him. He is surely between a hawk and a buzzard. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting to me, um, somebody wrote that down because she was illiterate as was Sojourner Truth. She could not read and she could not write and yet uh, she was often a spokesperson in public settings. And um, that's interesting because uh, someone remembered what she said uh, to some degree, and uh, we can read it today. Um, Sojourner Truth, the other person who was remembered <coughs> on this occasion as was um, Harriet Tubman. Uh, she also had an original name, Isabella Baumtree, born in New York as a slave. Um, and uh, she escaped from slavery in New York in 1826. And she said that she was called to testify to the hope within her, which is a biblical phrase, but it's something that she had picked up. Uh, she's famous for extemporaneous speeches, one called Ain't I a Woman? Um, I think uh, it would be wonderful if we had that speech, but we don't have uh, much of what she said. And yet she became famous for traveling all over and uh, uh, participating in these uh, abolitionist rallies and uh, delivering major speeches which rallied people even though she had never read anything and couldn't write anything down. She, she listened to everything simply by, by ear. Uh, she's the first African-American woman who has a bust in the Capitol. Uh, that's in Washington. Uh, she died in 1883 and there were a thousand people who were present at the Congregational Presbyterian Church where she was a member. Uh, she insisted on using the name Sojourner. I find that interesting because a niece of mine named her son uh, Mason Sojourner, and I never had a chance to ask her whether she's relating it somehow to Sojourner Truth, but she was a traveling woman uh, who always wanted to tell the truth, and that's why she called herself Sojourner Truth. She was a preacher who insisted on it. Um, Do you know why Harriet Tubman changed her name at all? Um, <coughs> I'm thinking Tubman, must Tubman is her married name. She, okay. she got married. Oh, okay. Um, Harriet, I don't remember why uh, that. <laughs> Probably it was her slave name, that original name, so maybe she was trying to it's possible. get away from it. And also, it's did we not, did we have a stop on the Underground Railroad here in Wauwatosa? We did, yeah. Yes. American Baptist Church. Okay, and where is that? That's just up 
up the street. Okay, yeah, I was thinking about that. Huh. Sure. Okay, thank oh, you. Wow. <coughs> um, just a couple of things uh, to remember about them. Uh, I always think um, this particular saying of, of uh, Harriet Tubman's is powerful. If you hear the dogs, keep on going. If you um, see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop, keep going. If you want to taste freedom, keep going. And her religious perspective, twan me, twas the Lord. I always told him, I trust you. I didn't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you to lead me, and he always did. <coughs> and Sojourner's Speech and Aid Iowa. Catherine Winkworth, how many of you even know that name? Just a, a couple of you. Um, so she was a, a Brit born in, in, in a London suburb. She had no formal education. She was tutored by her father. And uh, he sent her for a year to Dresden, Germany, where an aunt lived. And there she learned German, <coughs> and that somehow fascinated her. So she began to translate poems and other kinds of things. And by the 1850s, she began to translate German hymns. Well, suddenly she became enamored of that in a crazy kind of way, and she translated 400 of them, 400 poems by 170 different authors, 73 of them are in Lutheran worship, 50 of the, 50, can be one, one. of 51. them in ELW, so they, we've used her hymns, we've sung her hymns, uh, she's a part of our heritage, and you'd think that she was a Lutheran composer. And I think of that because um, I have a funny story, my grandfather before me was a Lutheran pastor, in a little town in um, uh, Itasca, Illinois, uh, took its name from the Indian word for Itasca in Minnesota, and um, uh, he founded the church there and saw to it that the Constitution got written, and in the Constitution, <coughs> I chose to read it one day when I became the pastor there years later, and I read the Constitution about a year into my ministry, and there was an article that said, this congregation will use only Lutheran hymns. <laughs> so I knew my grandfather, and he was really straight and conservative. I'm sure he insisted on that being written in there. But I explained to the congregation meeting that that was simply incorrect. There was no such thing as Lutheran hymns, except perhaps Martin Luther's hymns, where he chose the theology, wrote the words, and wrote the music. And there are examples of that, and not many but that he did. So there's a classic example in today's worship service where we sang Ebenezer, um, often known as thy strong word did, did uh, cleave the darkness, but this time it was, I forgot the, the words, but it's <coughs> equally like you use the 32 foot stop and, and it's good that John used the organ on that one because it just booms. Um, that's a Welsh hymn, not a Lutheran hymn. And, and likewise, Hifferdal was the second hymn. That is not a Lutheran hymn in terms of the music. Uh, the music was written by another Welshman, John Williams. And Herman Stumfley, uh, a Lutheran pastor from East Coast somewhere, LCA years ago, wrote the words. So our <coughs> hymnody comes from all over the world, and there is no such thing as Lutheran hymns only. Uh, and so Catherine Winkworth has given us more hymns translated from German Lutheran settings than any other human being. And there are more Winkworth hymns translated in our hymnal than from any other translator. So remarkable woman. Um, she was in addition, never married, advocate for women's rights, help the poor. Um, the best loved hymns that we have like that one. I would love to sing it. I don't have a, uh, a pitch that I can give you, but if we knew how to find a pitch for it, and we could sing, you might not be able to read the words even from your distance, I don't know. But it's one I think we know and love that I had a thousand voices, and with a thousand tongues, 
Und dass ich tausend Stimmen hätte, uh, ist der German. Uh, so, um, there are many like that. <coughs> Florence Nightingale. Why was she called Florence? Because she was born in Florence. Florence. Clever parents. Um, her parents wanted her to get, the, she was rich, parents were very rich. Uh, they had an estate in England, um, which they returned to. Uh, they wanted her to get married and um, marry a rich man and carry on their tradition. But when she was about 30, she went to a place which every nurse, at least a Lutheran nurse, I've often heard them tell me this, um, in, in Germany called Kaiserswerth. Kaiserswerth uh, was a institution that was established by a Lutheran pastor, Theodor Fliedner. And he did this because uh, the Industrial Revolution had taken place and suddenly, speaking of Women's History Month, there were all kinds of women who nobody was offering marriage to so that was their only opportunity. There were no such jobs that women could be hired for. And he thought, what's gonna happen to all these women? And therefore, I will create some kind of institution uh, and we will call them deaconesses. And some of these deaconesses will get nurses training and others will become parish workers. So the, the, the nurses were called in German Krankenschwester. Uh, and uh, many of these Krankenschwester and the deaconess mothers came to the United States, and Milwaukee had such a mother house here, uh, where deaconess came and they trained, um, that would have been something, uh, they trained uh, nurses to serve in local hospitals and other institutions. And this is where she had her beginning. So in all of these people, with the exception of Harriet Tubman, there's a Lutheran connection. So the Lutheran connection in the case of Catherine Winkworth is she translated German Lutheran hymns like crazy, even though she was an Anglican. In the case of Florence Nightingale, she was also Anglican, um, but she uh, studied nursing in a Lutheran uh, institution and uh, became the founder of modern nursing. And today in London at King's College is her school that she founded, it's, it's, uh, is carried on. She was so famous that they wanted to bury her in Westminster Abbey, but the family objected, and so now she's buried at a little country church, St. Margaret's, and I forgot what, what village. Uh, one thing that's interesting to me about what she became known as took place in Crimea, and we know Crimea via a totally different historical context, namely the fact that um, uh, Russia wanted to take it back. But at the time of Florence Nightingale, there was a debate going on between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire wanted um, Crimea and Russia wanted it. And so France and Britain sided with uh, the Ottoman Empire against Russia to keep Crimea uh, in, their, in their clutches. And, um, Florence Nightingale felt called to go there and help the soldiers who were being, the British soldiers especially, being hurt so badly. And so the picture is of her walking around with a lantern, the lady with the lamp is what she became known as. And she walked around at night between the soldiers' beds and cared for them. And it's this that she then brought back to nursing uh, as a way of uh, committing herself to the care of the sick and, and the needy. Somebody has here a passage, uh, which is the pledge um, of Florence Nightingale that every nurse is supposed to read. And I wonder if that could be read for us. Yeah. Font is a bit challenging. I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and, and or to practice my profession faithfully and will abstain from behavior that is deleterious and mischievous 
and will not take or knowingly administer any harmful drug, will do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standing of my profession and will hold in confidence all personal matters committed to my keeping and all family affairs knowingly, oh, oh, coming to my knowledge in the practice of my calling. With loyalty, will, and that word is unclear, to and the physician in his work and uh, dedicate myself to the welfare of those committed to my care. Okay, and that was written in a script which <laughs> the nurses originally got to sign. Uh, hard to make out some of the lettering. But um, that takes you back to Florence and to her um, uh, heritage that she, that she left us. Um, was there anything else? Was there something by Winkworth I had given someone? No, I have Cook. Or Who? Cited in Cook. I have Florence Nightingale. Also, also. Would you would you read that? Please? Yes. And I just I had a book on Florence Nightingale when I was a child, and it was my favorite book. Mm -hmm. I just loved reading it. Was, she, it this, was it that one? I think. Well, that one's probably. I'm probably too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> She is a ministering angel without any exaggeration in these hospitals, and as her slender form glides <laughs> quietly along each corridor, every poor fellow's face softens with gratitude at the sight of her. When all the medical officers have retired for the night and silence and darkness have settled down upon those miles of prostrate sick, she may be observed alone with a little lamp in her hand making her solitary rounds. Okay, and this is the lamp she's carrying here. Fiat lux, let there be light, it says in Latin. And um, this is the book that she wrote about Kaiser's Verd on the Rhine. Uh, it was her first book, <coughs> and um, it, it made Kaiser's Verd famous beyond Germany. Uh, so that uh, nursing always looks back to that beginning, but her Lutheran connection is that, even though she was herself Anglican, her father was Unitarian, and she was frankly more ecumenical. Um, did, did, was there anything about, um, just going back for a moment to, um, did anybody have something on Weakworth to read that I didn't? As for no. I have Nightingale quotes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Let's have some of those. Okay. Let each person tell the truth from his own experience. Everything is sketchy. The world does nothing but sketch. Life is a hard fight, a struggle, a wrestling with the principle of evil, hand to hand, foot to foot. Every <coughs> inch of the way is disputed. The night is given us to take a breath, to pray, to drink deep to the fountain of power. The day to use the strength which has been given us, to go forth to work with it till the evening. Patriotism is not enough. There must be no hatred or bitterness for anyone. Live life when you have it. Life is a splendid gift. There is nothing small about it. For the greatest things grow by God's law out of the smaller. But to live your life, you must discipline it. You must not fretter it away in fair purpose, erring acts, inconstant will. But make your thoughts, your acts, all work to the same end, and that end not self, but God. That is what we call character. And lastly, never dispute with anyone who wishes to contradict you. I did want to add, I had the opportunity to practice nursing in London, England um, for <coughs> over a year and a half. And the Florence Nightingale Museum, which is across from St. Thomas Hospital and School, which is the school she founded, has her lantern in it. So uh, Her actual, her actual lantern. Yes. Yeah, <coughs> it's it's a very, for me, it was a very enlightening museum to take in. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
Elizabeth of Hungary. Here is an example of somebody who was actually sainted, beatified, canonized, made a saint within the Roman Catholic communion. Um, Luther would have known her as Saint Elizabeth. Uh, there are Saint Elizabeth churches all over Europe. Um, and interestingly enough, from a Lutheran standpoint, she was born in the Wartburg, uh, where Luther spent his time translating the Bible, translating the New Testament uh, into Greek. Uh, not actually the Hebrew. He translated only the Greek there at, at the Wartburg. Um, she was married in one of those kind of alliances at the age of 14. Don't know really whether that marriage was, was um, uh, consecrated, but I, I think um, she was given to somebody so that some alliances would be cemented as a result of that marriage. Uh, her husband then died rather shortly, <laughs> and um, she spent her time serving the sick, establishing hospitals. She established a hospital in Marburg. Um, took a vow of celibacy, never married again, and uh, became known for her um, gifts to the poor. Um, <coughs> shortly after she died, they began building this church uh, in Marburg. That's rather odd. I don't know what happened there. Um, there you see the artwork where she was born, and there you see a statue of St. Elizabeth. But uh, I wanted to show you, I don't know why that doesn't show on there. Um, in the Wartburg today, you can still see it, and Luther saw it at his time, because Elizabeth preceded him, great murals that are painted about St. Elizabeth and her work for the poor and caring for the sick and the needy. So he would have known all about that as he walked around in the haunts of the Wartburg while he was there. Uh, but this was um, where she was born, where she was married. She grew up as the, um, the princess of that um, area of the country. I'm not sure what you'd call it, uh, what name you'd give to it. And so um, I say that she is for Europe what uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe became for <coughs> the Americans. Because at least in the Roman Catholic Church, they will say that Our Lady of Guadalupe is the patron saint of the Americans. Uh, even though that was Mexico where this took place, she's regarded as the patron saint of the Americas in the Roman Catholic Church. Elizabeth has that same kind of recognition in Europe. And there are Elizabethan churches, if you can use that word, all over the place in Europe. So, um, did anyone have anything to read on Elizabeth? I don't think so. We don't really know much about what she said. Lucy, yeah. But we're going to come to Lucy. You can call her Lucy. Um, my wife and I attended uh, for a while a church here in Milwaukee uh, called uh, St. Paul's Episcopal Church, and they have glorious Tiffany windows. And one of them is of St. Lucy. And there she stands with a plate and in the plate are her eyes. Mm -hmm. Because St. Lucy, uh, in 304, I think, was martyred, and uh, the legend says her eyes were plucked out as part of the torture that she underwent. Um, and so then uh, the eyes are put on a plate in, in iconography, and she is remembered as, as someone who lost her sight. But she becomes the patron saint of the blind, uh, as a result and of um, um, the, the sick because she comes to be a healer, patron saint of nurses. Um, what was important that made her finally um, so significant in Scandinavia and specifically in Sweden? Um, I'll bet somebody with Swedish roots knows the answer to that. What was the question? The question is, whatever made her so important to the Swedes? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> but he does have uh, the famous song that is sung. Let, uh, let me see if I can show you. <clears throat> so that lovely setting there on St. Lucy's Day, the 13th of December, is very important in the Swedish community, even in the United States. 
And so you find a lot of um, communities <coughs> that have, Gustavus Adolphus College, for example, has a celebration of um, St. Lucy's Day and people sing the song that you can read for us and they uh, put the candles on the head of St. Lucy and uh, there's lovely singing that takes place. You, you want to read some Swedish to us? Read the Swedish, yeah. <laughs> Ja, det er godt, kun der fag hun godt udstyre. King og Sumas fyr, der skungar mig ruder. Anyway, night walks with a heavy step around yard and hearth. And the sun departs from earth, shadows are brooding. There is dark house walking with lit candles. Santa Lucia, Santa Lucia. I can go on. Night walks grand, yet silent, now hear its gentle wings. In every room so hushed, whispering like wings. Look at the threshold, stands white clad, with light in her hair. Santa Lucia, Santa Lucia, darkness shall take flight soon from earth's valleys. So she speaks wonderful <coughs> words to us. A new day will rise again with the rosy sky, Santa Lucia, Santa Lucia. And we celebrated this every year in our home, and then you carry around rice pudding, Santa Lucia, and in the rice pudding are two almonds. And if you get an almond in your share of the rice pudding, you get one of her eyes to see the light of Christ. <laughs> 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 to give you an idea of the way the story is told to children. And it's very, uh, very, very popular. Both my daughters got married with Santa Lucia crowns. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful tradition. And let's think again about why the Scandinavians um, made that significant on December 13th, why they made Santa St. Lucy, the patron saint, on December the 13th. Uh, for example, just two days ago, I got a, um, an email from a theologian in, in Finland, and he said, now is the time of the year when we will no longer have any night. Mm -hmm. uh, so December 13th is close to the winter solstice, right. can even take place on the 13th, depending on the year. So the celebration of the one who brings light uh, to those who now see in Christ, uh, even though they were once blind, um, is fitting beyond that day. Um, there is a Lutheran church in Paris, St. Lucy's Lutheran Church in Paris, just to show you that Lucy was not celebrated only by the Roman Catholic. Well, we come to Catherine von Bora. Uh, most of us know something about her. Um, and I know way more about her than I can put in this little frame. But uh, she was born in Lippendorf. Um, I have a friend who was a pastor in Lippendorf. And he says that the tradition of the von Boras goes way back uh, in that congregation. Uh, which was the congregation that was hers when she grew up there originally as a child. Um, she was, as a young girl, put into a cloister because maybe they had too many children, and so she was to be raised in a cloister. She wasn't there long, and she was put into another cloister, 1509, because her aunt was in that cloister. And often parents, if they had too many children, they just give them to a cloister to raise, and so she was raised in that cloister. Interesting thing about her name because I have some ties in, in Texas with people who were called winds or sorbs. Uh, von Bora in Sorbish means pine tree. So one of the theories about uh, the name is that uh, Catherine had windish or Sorbian roots. And that's very interesting <coughs> theory because Luther said some very negative things about the winds and the sorbs. Uh, and this is recorded in the so-called table talk, the Tishraden, the volumes which uh, remember uh, things that took place around the family table, which Katie served and Luther gathered with the students and the children and whatever. And he often said, and, and I'm guessing that he said them kind of smart-alically. 
you know, because there was his wife Kate of the Wend, and he said, yeah, these Wends are really stupid. Uh, but sometimes the comments were not so nice. Um, she wrote Luther a letter and said, how do we get out of here? Because the word about leaving the nunneries um, was out. And so Luther made arrangements for a guy to come with a truck filled with herring, which the nuns would eat. When the herring was out of the barrels, they stuck some nuns in the barrels. <laughs> and they hauled them off to Wittenberg. And Luther tried to hook them up with some families and some marriages. And he was successful, but only one he could not hook up, and that was Katie. So he tried uh, to find a couple people that might be willing to marry her, and she uh, did not. And she said to him, I will marry only one person, and that's you. Uh, and so Luther thought about that for a while. And he was 41, she was 26. He married her, they had six children. They had four children they had adopted. And so there were 10 children around the table all the time. In addition to which there were always aunts and, and uh, nephews and, and one guy who was kind of uh, mentally challenged. And, and so there was this vast table of people that Kate was serving. The uh, sad thing is, once Luther had died, um, she basically lost everything, and she went back to Torgau, uh, where she owned some property, and one day she was driving in an ox cart, and the thing crashed by the side of the road somehow, and she fell out and was very badly hurt and died shortly thereafter. So she's buried in Torgau, in, in the church there. What she became in the um, generations that followed in Europe, and especially among the Protestants, was a symbol of family life, and very specifically of clergy life. Because clergy had typically not been married. So what did it look like? So there were pictures made and printed in books of Luther and his wife and his children, and uh, it was a powerful story. What I think would be fascinating, because what remains for us are some of the letters that Luther wrote to, to Katie. We don't have any letters extant that she wrote to him, although he refers to them, so we know they existed. But he was the traveling man. He was like the sojourner. He was always out somewhere trying to settle a dispute between somebody or other. And uh, he would then write to Katie, his beloved princess, and um, those letters are extant, and that would be a wonderful uh, topic to have sometime here as we discover what the relationship was of the first Protestant family. Are the table talks before he was married? <clears throat> um, the table talks would probably have been written uh, only um, after he sat at table with, with Kate. Yeah. And, uh, I can't imagine that they were written before that. Right. Uh, there she lies, <laughs> her grave in Torgau. Uh, there's a picture of her and the family. They had five, ch uh, six children. Um, one of the saddest uh, letters that Luther wrote, he's off on one of his trips, and the daughter is dying. So he writes this very emotional letter about his love for her. This is Kate's ring, still exists, and it says in here, Rutero Katerina. I don't know. Rutero Morning Star Hall Fair of Bright was written in his grieving. Of, for the daughter? Yeah, because he was absolutely heartbroken. I yeah. told that, that, that beautiful epiphany him. Yeah, I don't know that, but that's interesting. Somebody has a letter. Madame. He you? didn't call her a stupid wind here. <laughs> no. <laughs> His letters are lovely. Dearly beloved wife, Katharina Luther, for her own hands. God greet thee in Christ, my dearly loved Katie. I hope if Dr. Who? Who and maybe? Receives leave of absence as he gives me fair hope of doing, that I can come home with him tomorrow or the day after. Pray God that he bring me home safe and sound. 
I sleep extremely well, about six or seven hours consecutively, and then two or three hours afterward. That, as I take it, is due to the beer. <laughs> but I am just as abstentious as the beer. Dr. Casper says that the caries under which our gracious elector suffers has eaten no further into the food. Foot, but such martyrdom, no dobich, no prisoner on the ladder of Jack the Jailer's tower endures, as his electoral grace has to undergo from the surgeons. His electoral grace is as sound in his entire body as a little fish. Only the devil has bitten and stung him in the foot. Pray, pray on. I hope God will hear us, as he has begun to do. For Dr. Casper believes, too, that God must help here. As Johannes Rischmann goes away, necessity and fairness alike demand that I let him depart honorably from me. For you know he has served us faithfully and diligently, and according to his ability has truly held to the gospel in humility, and has done and suffered everything. Wherefore, think how often we have given presents to worthless knaves and ungrateful scholars where it was simply thrown away. So in this case, be liberal and let nothing be wanting to such a pious fellow. For you know it is money well spent and is well pleasing to God. I know well that there is but little in the purse, but I would willingly give him ten gilded if I had it. Less than five gilded, however, you must not pay him, for he has no clothing. Whatever you can bestow above that, do, I beg. The parish coffer might, it is true, honor me by giving something to such a man, seeing that I must support my servants at my own expense for their church's service and use, but as they will. Do not you let anything be lacking so long as we still have a mug. Think where you have gotten it. God will give other things that I know. Herewith I command you to God. Command you to God. Amen. And say to the parson from Zwickau that he should be content and make the best of his lodging. When I come, I will tell how Milford and I were guests in a, in a read, read us all, read us house, and Milford exhibited much wisdom to me. But I was not thirsty for such a drink. Kiss the young Hans for me, and bid little Johnny and Lena and Auntie Lena pray for the dear elector and for me. I cannot find anything in the city to buy for the children, although it is the time of the fair. Since I can bring nothing special, have something on hand for me to give. <laughs> so that's how it typically is. If the father can't think of what to buy for the children, the mother has to find it. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, here they are, <laughs> of the six that we chose, uh, and so somehow this got screwed up uh, with the Wartburg pictures that's supposed to be there. <laughs> um, now that happened. Um, but these are the women we looked at. Um, they all have significant roles uh, to play within the life of the church. The church remembers them much as we perhaps can think about people that we would nominate here to be remembered. Um, in the uh, one of the, there was a church body called the Church of the Brethren uh, here in the United States, which had a seminary uh, in Oak Brook, and they moved it down to Richmond, Indiana. But uh, they had in their theology something called calling out gifts, and the idea was that on a Sunday morning you might just go up to Johnny, and Johnny's 15, and you're the pastor, or you're just anybody in the congregation. You say, Johnny, I think the Lord's calling you to be a mechanic because you are so good with tools. Uh, this is what they did in their church body. And I always found that very meaningful that they would look at people and try to uh, ask them, so what kind of gifts does that person have? And then they would seek to call those gifts out by naming them and, and offering that idea to somebody. And many people in that church body say that they grew up becoming what they became because they were commemorated by somebody uh, in the church. We commemorate um, saints on November 1st when we have all saints' prayers and remembrances and things like that. We might think of not just dead people, but living saints and people we'd like to call out and lift up among us. 
it could be a, a nice tradition for a church body that believes all of God's baptized people are saints. Anybody want to call out before we go out <laughs> into the world? I can make share if, if you ever go to Los Angeles, <clears throat> visit the new cathedral, not the Crystal Cathedral. It's become a Roman Catholic cathedral now, but the one built by a Spanish architect. And what you have is when you walk in, it's called the Cathedral of All Angels. And you walk in with the idea of birthing, and you start at the baptismal fount, and there's this huge, huge picture of Jesus being baptized or embracing his call to reflect God to the world. And then you take that water on you and you walk into the cathedral and the icons and beautiful paintings all along are the people of God. Basically called in their baptism to enlighten the world and present Christ to the world. And it's a powerful, powerful walk as you go in there to the understanding of the communion of saints. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. The, you know, that you'll write the, 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 what is it, the Holy Spirit, the Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and then the forgiveness of sins, that it's not perfection, where we get hung up with the word. But it's, you know, it's beautiful. Um, I like the fact that we have our font at the back. Oh, I love and it. So whenever I walk by it, I do what we used to do in Austin, Texas, we always dipped our finger in the water and made the sign of the cross because we are the baptized children of God. Beautiful, that's a so I love it too. Yeah. It kind of celebrates our sainthood by doing our that. baptism, yeah. Have a great day. Thank you so much.